I'd like to call the September 13, 2022 regular meeting of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors to order. Our student representative, Benta Kali, will present the land acknowledgement this evening. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Ever Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you very much, um, Student Rep. Colley. We will please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Lusane. Present. Vice President Mitchell. Uh, present. Director Nichols. Present. Director Mason. Present. Director Herman. Present. Student Representative Colley. Present. Student Representative Gilbertson. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Our first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, would you introduce this evening's agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following. The superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, segment for public comments, segment for routine business, segment for information discussion, segment for new business, segment for upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, the following changes were made to the agenda. Item 7.01, the superintendent's report, the presentation was added. <coughs> Excuse me, item 10.05, Approval of the Everett Public Schools and Everett Association of Educational Office, Officer Personnel Collective Bargaining Agreement. The tentative agreement and salary scheduled was added. And item 14.01, policy 1400, meetings, proposed revision, the policy was updated, changes are highlighted in green. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salzman. Is there a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Director Nichols and seconded by Director Mitchell to adopt the agenda. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, we'll now proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Those no, say no. The motion carries. The agenda is adopted. We'll now move to section 6.00 which is our recognition section. There are no recognitions scheduled to come before this meeting. We'll now move to section 7.0, which is the superintendent's report. Dr. Schultzman, it's your report. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors to the public this evening. Welcome back. It was great visiting each of our schools and seeing our kids engaged in learning. Thank you for our bus drivers for keeping students safe to and from school. We covered all schools during the first week. I'd like to take this time to thank our entire staff, our parents and our board, and if all staff can please stand up in here tonight to honor you. So I wanna thank you for making it a great opening. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Don't have a smooth opening unless you have great people in, in here and out in the school centers, everywhere in the district, amazing people made it happen. So thank you. <clears throat> Welcome back, kindergarten. <laughs> Our youngest learners are back. Welcome all kindergarten students. Many attended Ever Ready, which gave them some practice for school, made it a lot easier in that transition. Want to welcome and thank them. And September 19th, developmental preschool, any cap is back. And I will tell you the night before, I know that Ann Arnold slept really well, but she's glad those kindergartens made it back. <laughs> so thank you. Gosh, you know what's really exciting? The interactive panels have been installed. 
amazing job by our learning information technology team. Wow. Amazing. Installing and training staff, these incredible tools have been a game changer in our elementary schools, and I will share that with you. All middle and high schools have them in their classrooms being set up. It's awesome. Our interactive panels are already changing student engagement. To Brian Beckley, this team, salutes and thank you. So I want to thank everybody again. We've had an amazing opening. Great joy to be back in school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saltman. It's wondered. It's a wonder that we're back at school. It's so wonderful. I am so happy. Um, next, we will move to section 8.0, which is board comments. And I'd like to start with our student rep because it is because of them that we are here, our students. So we'll start at that end of the dais and then come around for board comments. And we'd like to hear from our students first. Student rep Gilbertson. I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Hi, I'm so I'm so happy to be here and be part of the board with all of these people. And the first week of school so far has been wonderful. A little complication with schedules, not getting exactly what was there, but people have been seem have been seeming to get that fixed and a lot of people I've seen have been pretty happy with their schedules. And the first day and still on to now, our leadership students have been standing outside our main building, the A building, welcoming everyone. And I know on the first day they were there to help all the new students, like the freshmen and new to the school, just help them find their classes and everything. And it was wonderful to see that. They were so enthusiastic and teachers standing outside of their classrooms ready to help people get to the class they need if they didn't know. I know I had to ask. <laughs> And I'm just really happy with how it's been so far. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all. We've had an amazing start to the 2022-2023 school year. We've had Friday Night Light football games back up and running, which have gone great with the big turnout and only wins for the Bruins so far. There's been a lot of school involvement with this new year with ASB, cheer, and the school all together as one. The start of the new academic year is always full of promise, aspirations, and vitality. Thank you to the board for the difference you make to our schools. It doesn't go unnoticed. Our schools are better because of the work you guys do. And to every student in our district, we are here to support the quality of your educational experience and your ultimate success. So here's to an extraordinary year together like one we've had no other. Thank you very much, student rep Colin. Perfect. Director Herman. I just want to start off tonight saying it's so wonderful to have you both here uh, with us and this year I'm so excited to be working with you and having having you both represent students, so I look forward to that so welcome. Um, to our newest student you're actually you, you're beating me in your time here <laughs> you have more time than I do. Um, I want to say thank you to, to the schools for all of the um extra welcome get together social tours all these things that were taking place these last few weeks that were helping students and families um just get to know the school ease some of that anxiety it it crossed my mind that this is sort of how we onboard students and families to the everett school district and how important that is and also a shout out to all the events that were happening for sixth graders and ninth graders those transition years um, can also just be a, a little bit of a challenging time. So we recognize that schools went out of their way uh, with communication and, and it did seem to go very smoothly. So much appreciation and just some positive feedback that I've heard. Also, I wanted to give a shout out, a special thank you to uh, Special Services Director Kelly Clevenger and Mindy Arnold on our consent agenda tonight is a um, agreement with the Carl Gibson center in Everett and that's for the transition program for 18 to 21 year olds so special students that are going to have a few extra years in the goal program and um, so I just think that's fantastic so thank you thank you for highlighting that as well um, I my excitement since we last were together was I got to uh, visit a couple campuses on the first day of school and I have to say the energy of the first day of school is unlike anything ever. And it was just so great to be a part of it again, especially since my kids aren't on campuses anymore. Um, and, you know, everything from, um, I was at Everett High escorting 
students their classroom until I realized I had a class I had no idea where it was. So I had to ask another student. Um, but you know, that was okay as a learning opportunity for all of us. And um, being in the front office of an elementary school the first day of class is just crazy. The things that they are multitasking with nonstop, um, very high energy. And, um, and from my my perspective, everyone walked away pretty happy with um, the, the support and um, staff interaction. So great to great to be a part of it. And thanks to everyone who made that happen. So briefly, just wanted to thank two groups of people um, for successful start of the school year. Um, one is our amazing transportation department um, and their Durham staff, you know, just like every year prior to this, um, except for maybe the 100% remote year, um, there's been mix ups and miss bus stops and all sorts of different things. Um, but every time that I've talked to um, anybody in transportation or at Durham, they've been calm, polite, they've been just really professional on top of it and trying to work around and solve problems. So I really, really appreciate them. And I also want to uh, appreciate parents, their patience, uh, with getting all these kinks out um, the first, you know, the first couple of days, especially for the kindergartners, you know, since my son's bus uh, didn't make it for the first two days, I got to drop him off and, and at school and um, stand in line with other parents and, and other kids. And just it was so great seeing how excited they all were to just get into it and get started um, and just super happy with that. So that's all I have. Um, I want to say that um, I appreciate too that um, I got to see the first day of school on social media and I just really do appreciate when when we post just good news and just great news and I believe that's the for me the best use of social media is just that great news um, and to see all those schools since I was um, out of town but I did have the pleasure of going to Emerson um, yesterday morning to welcome the kindergartners and just like director Mason said um, being in that front office is all the kindergartners are trying to come in and I found out that Emerson has um, a continuous flow of kids in and out so they had different kids Monday than they had last Wednesday and I'm trying to get all those kids where they were supposed to be and I really did feel like I saw where the sausage was made and somebody like um, uh, uh, director Nichols son all he knew was that his bus didn't come and dad took care of him and he got to the the cafeteria just fine and that was my goal I was charged with um, getting the kids from the parent drop off to the cafeteria and I was very happy with that especially a young lady that was um, not talking and um, I needed to know where she needed to go so I said um do you speak English or Spanish uh, habla inglés or habla español and she said English so somehow in my English and Spanish she knew how to say English um, and then we got her where she needed to go but um it was wonderful and then the the, the office manager Lelaine um I think she hired me um, to be there every morning to help. I had to tell her I have a full-time job and there's a conflict of interest, um, but then she made me put things on her calend my calendar um, so that I can attend things at the school. And um, I was very happy with that. And I just think that I have rarely met an advocate such as her for her school. Um, she said this was her, her second year at the school, had a full year, and um, she fully believes that that is the most unique school in the entire district, and her advocacy for her school, um, I could feel, and I would welcomely become a para there, but um, I do have a full-time job. Um, so just want to thank everybody and just welcome everybody back. <laughs> Well, I am so excited for school to have started. I'm very happy with the staff's response to all of our parents' queries and their students' queries. They have gone out of the way. I spent first day of school at uh, Monroe and at Eisenhower, and I can truly say I, you know, I may not have been very good at directing car traffic, but I did try to keep the cars flowing. And I did do my best at Monroe getting the first graders into the, um, the gymnasium. There were a couple of them that lost their way, but they, I think they found their way. They were also uh, having breakfast during that day. And so it was a 
it was a chore of deciding, well, have you had breakfast or do you need to go to the cafeteria? I mean, to the gymnasium. But it was really good, and I got to see some really great staff out there in um, unique, um, welcoming costumes. I'm going to say that. <laughs> unique, welcoming costumes, very colorful. And so you could tell that they were enjoying their day immensely. So I'm so happy school was back in order. I look forward to having our uh, meet some of the students further on in their uh, journey through education and also meet the teachers involved too. So as we progress, I'm looking forward to it. We shall now move on to section 9.0. And that is public comments. Uh, he is not on board. Okay. So we did have somebody online to speak, but they're not there now, so we shall move on. We no longer have anybody um, live and in person, so we shall move to section 10.0, which is our consent agenda. Dr. Salzman, would you provide an introduction for our consent agenda this evening? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public this evening. The Board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personal actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts, grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes it includes items that occur less frequently, but are of routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report one or more weeks before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or consider a discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received no questions. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salzman. A motion to adopt the consent agenda is now in order. So moved. And is it there a second? Second. It's been moved by Director Mason and seconded by Director Herman to approve the consent agenda. Does any director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in the new business section of this meeting? Hearing no requests, we'll now proceed to the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The motion carries. The consent agenda is approved. We'll now move to section 11.0 in that strategic progress monitoring section. There are no items scheduled to come before this meeting under section 11.0. So we'll move to section 12.0, which is our information discussion section. We will now get a summer update for this meeting, and I see Dr. Scott is at the podium. Dr. Scott, you have it. Thank you very, very much. So I set this up here. Well, good evening, uh, President Lassane, uh, Board of Directors, Dr. Salzman. It's a privilege to be here tonight to talk about some significant investments we've made this summer to launch successfully the 22-23 school year. And that's really our goal is to highlight some, some key pieces of those investments here. You're going to see some information on the summer leadership development, induction processes, uh, professional learning extensively for multiple purposes, summer programs that, that both uh, address academic needs as well as navigational needs, and then, um, particularly through our regionals, the student achievement focused preparations with pr the principal core on um, improving student performance. Those are all means, all of these things are means to the ultimate end of improving student performance. And I think that's going to be the, if we're successful tonight, that's going to be the, the key um, success criteria for, for this evening. Our strategic plan served as the anchor for our Summer Leadership Institute, which took place at Jackson High School on August 1 through 5. And you can see the purpose there. All the sessions were designed to focus our, on leadership impact towards student achievement. And you can see the definition, although it's in small print there. The defined uh, definition around student achievement as demonstrating both proficiency and growth aligned to standards. And we also had fun too. I love this picture here. We had a true kickoff with the World Cup soccer theme, so we had a lot of fun. 
some of the sampling here, and this is a wordy slide, but it, we decided to keep some things in here so you get kind of the, the sense of the gamut of, of and the diversity of sessions that we had here, a sampling. Um, strengthening our collective and individual practice, understanding pandemic related impacts on students and ourselves, and importantly, how to move forward with resilience, optimism, and strategies. Deeper dives into student achievement data and gaps that need to be closed systematically. The annual cadence of continuous improvement cycles and planning. And then these through lines around strategic initiatives that asked each administrator, so not just a sit and get, but to have them locate themselves in what do I need to know as a leader? What do I need to know? What do I need to do? How is my work connected to this, irrespective of where I work? And how will those questions above impact and influence the development of my school improvement plan or my department action plan? And this is in, in thinking about um, why induction matters. I'm gonna, we're going to cover here in a bit the new administrator's induction highlight, new higher orientation and ongoing professional learning. Um, all of which were intentionally designed again around those four pillars and anchored in the strategic plan. We know induction is so important because it's often our first opportunity to really reinforce what our core values are and strategic priorities. It also, as you can imagine, builds a sense of, of cohort, a sense of belonging and inclusion. It also recognizes the complexity of what we do for a living in, in learning and teaching. And one of my favorite quotes is a, a NASA engineer turned teacher named Ryan Fuller who pointed out, teaching isn't rocket science, it's actually harder. <laughs> and he should know because he was a, 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 a NASA scientist. So first up is the new administrator induction. Well, one of the first events we have every year is the induction of our new administrators to Everett Public Schools. And I personally enjoy these two days with our newest instructional leaders in Everett. And central to that is the building of relationships and, and bringing them into the Everett Public Schools family. Because the relationships they build in those two days with their new colleagues is a support network that will continue with them for the whole time that they're here with us um, working with our students. And so uh, in, in some of the professional development that our new administrators receive, we always start with our foundation, which is the four pillars, culture, climate, systems, and instruction. And understanding how each of those four pillars manifests itself into the day-to-day -day work that they are engaged in when they get into those buildings and they're working with kids and families. Um, also, um, building up their knowledge and capacity to implement and, and communicate our strategic plan initiatives and the student um, outcome priority outcomes. Really important that each one of our new leaders really understand what are we working together collectively for and what are those outcomes or results that we're, we're striving to meet with the hard work we're putting in. Um, also, one of the things that's really important about this new administrator induction, as you can see here on these pictures, is the sense of community and really understanding the operational nature of the support that's behind them. So as leaders, yes, they're out there, they're in their buildings, but there's a whole support network of colleagues. And here you can see the Science Resource <coughs> Center and them having an experience to understand that science instruction in our district and the resources behind it have a team of people to support the work in our buildings. So each of our new administrators in this two-day orientation is really getting them into the family of Ever Public Schools and preparing them for success, not only in their first 90 days on the job, for, but for an entire year. Um, just as our administrators have an orientation, so do our certificated staff. And we have a plethora of pictures here to show you that exciting event that happened at the end of August. And our purpose is really to build those relationships, has been stated, be really welcoming and have a sense of belonging, and equip all of our teachers for those first few days, weeks, and months of school. OSPI charges us to make sure that our certificated staff are ready to launch the year, and that's what we intend to do. You can see there, we circle around with our pillars of culture and climate around the instruction there. All of the cheerleaders from all of the high schools were there to welcome our new hires. We had an ice cream social. You can see down in the, social, the bottom corner as well. Um, we had Webley, all of the different community, not just we welcome the certificated staff, but our community welcomed them as well. We had lots of vendors there for the first day of lunches and he welcomed the staff as well. Below that, there was a staff STEM challenge to help our staff bond 
have new colleagues that they can count on and to call upon. And the very bottom picture is our human resources department. They were there all four days to answer questions as well as our technology department. So we really wrapped around our climate and culture around the supports of instruction. You can see some key sessions that we had there as well. Everyone had personalized instruction to launch their year. As well, we had ongoing summer professional learning all throughout June through August, and just wanted to highlight a few of these things in instruction and curriculum. We had a lot of institutes. We had AVID, we had an AP Institute, and we had a Summer Math Institute. You can see some other things that went along there. Jumping over to social emotional learning, a lot of things happened. We wanted to highlight the ruler training. We're continuing that as a year long focus. It'll be the focus of our October Lid Day as well. There was a lot of professional development to help that social emotional piece in the ruler curriculum specifically. And gap closing, a lot of different classes that focused on looking at the data and what does that mean for your instruction. And I wanted to highlight the paraeducator annual professional learning day because it takes everyone in our system. It takes classified and certificated and all of our departments working together to close those gaps. So we wanted to just highlight a few of the things of many things that happened this summer and thank you for your support in that. Our new mantra in Everett Public Schools is that kindergarten starts with Everett Ready. We had an amazing year this year, and we were really excited about the kind of participation we had. Um, Everett Ready began in 2016 to serve students who didn't have an early learning experience. It was in two schools that first year, and we served just <coughs> over 50 students. We've grown a lot since that time. In 2020, Everett implemented Transitional Kindergarten, a state-funded program that allowed us to bring in students who didn't have early learning experience and give them 20 weeks from January to June to really be prepared for success in kindergarten when they arrived. That opportunity allowed us to modify Everett Ready, move it to late in the summer, and make it a transition program for every one of the students in, in Everett Public Schools, which was a huge shift and, and really impactful for our students. You can see the statistics up here, and I just want to highlight specifically the 1,108 kindergartners who were registered for Everett Ready this year. That was 77% of the total enrolled at that time, which is pretty tremendous. The other really exciting thing about Everett Ready was that we provided bus transportation. So no longer was getting to school a barrier, and every student who was eligible could get on a bus and could be there on that day. It was, it was a pretty exciting moment for all of us to see these kids coming in just really excited, and they're the only ones there. You know, it's not like the, sixth, the fifth graders are there, or the third graders are there, it's just kindergartners, and it really allows us to focus on them and help them become ready. We know that when children have that kind of experience prior to coming to school at the beginning of the year, they're, they're confident, they're ready to go, they understand the routines, and they can really be successful at, uh, and ready to learn on day one. The photo in the upper left-hand corner is of a little boy who um, at this time last year had had no early learning experience. His mom took him to Play and Learn, which is our drop-in program that's free to all families in birth to five. And he uh, participated in, ever, in um, Play and Learn, I'm sorry, and then heard about transitional kindergarten. So his mom got him into transitional kindergarten in January, and now he uh, attended Everett Ready. He's counting the plastic teddy bears there and sorting them by color. The amazing thing is he had three high quality early learning experiences before he ever came to kindergarten. And I had the unique pleasure just yesterday of seeing him at school in kindergarten, marching along, just ready to go. And I have to tell you, it was so exciting to see him. He was engaged, he was following directions, he was excited to be there. And that's that's not quite the same picture we saw last January. So it was just really, um, a wonderful picture to see. And then we heard um, some of the teachers saying to kids in the last two days, um, remember, it's just like Everett Ready. You can do it, put it in your locker. It's just like Everett Ready. And I thought what an amazing testament it is to a program that every school in our district um, offered to every kindergartner. So kindergarten really does start with Everett Ready in Everett Public Schools, and that's a huge gift to all of our families. So thank you for your support. So in addition to Everett Ready and all that amazing stuff, for sure, um, our summer programming, actually we had a huge summer academy for our students who are currently in grades, first grade through 12th grade. 
some of which are graduated, which is really nice to see as well. Um, we had an elementary, middle, and high school program, all of which was tuition free. We had free breakfast and lunch for all of our students, as well as transportation across the district. When it came to our elementary school summer academy, we had six sites that hosted the program. At those six sites, we, we had it for all of our kids across the district. We had 828 students who participated at those sites, and the programming largely took place um, in June and July, really in July lie there. So our programming really focused on social emotional learning with our second step curriculum that we use through the school year. Our teachers, it was an opportunity to really learn the lessons that they would be teaching during the school year and students were really immersed in it. It was really grounding each day as they came in that that was part of their lessons. In addition, we had English language arts through our reach for reading curriculum, which is what we use during the school year. So it reinforced the skills and understandings that they have while they're with us during the year. Our language and literacy through science themes took place through GLAD strategies. So many of the ways in which we talk about engaging our multilingual learners are really strategies for all of our students and making sure that they can access um, the learning. And so that was used. It also reinforced, again, what teachers know about how to use those strategies. We partnered with an outside group called the National Summer School Initiative. We started this work last summer and expanded it because um, it had a profound um, effect really on teachers, the learning that took place in their professional development and for students. For our elementary school students, there were two parts to their math learning. One part was math foundations, which really set the baseline for where they were and heading into the next grade and then math problem solving that used the next grade level standards so that students were already experiencing really rigorous learning along with problem solving that was related to their grade. We had an extensive newcomer program, recovery services, extended school year services as well. And I recognize some faces here who might have helped me during the summer because Everett Public Schools Foundation, uh, with their generous donation, allowed each student to go home with two books. And so they paid for those books. Students got to select those books. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity just for them to really engage in some of those things. And how many times kids were so excited to go home and share what it is they were taking home. So that that was a great culmination to the summer. Our middle school program uh, took place at Evergreen Middle School. 366 students were part of it. Those students would be currently in grades six through eight, again, mostly taking place in July. We had social emotional learning lessons each day. They were really tied to the National Summer School Initiative that I mentioned. Here in the middle school program, it was, ex it was the entire program that we served. So it had the reading and the math components. The novel studies were very high interest grade level novels. Um, I saw kids who I think are normally reluctant readers, very excited about the topics that were in those books. Um, close reading strategies was another aspect of it. And again, like the elementary learning, but at uh, the respective grade levels, math foundations and problem solving. We also had an extensive bridge to compacted math academy for students who are ready to go on to our compacted math courses. That's seven eighth compacted and eighth grade algebra compacted. So students have ways to enter into all the programs that we have. Again, a large multilingual, pro multilingual program, recovery services and extended school year services all at one location. So all of our kids together. And then our high school summer academy, Cascade High School, which we've hosted for many years, 729 students were there, grades, current grades, because some of them were eighth graders going to ninth grade, uh, nine through 12, we had we had 1,148 classes that for each of those classes earned a half credit because that's how much they earn. Uh, most of that prog programming takes place in July and for our online high school classes, it goes into a little bit of August as well. So our credit recovery programs are um, well served, lots of kids attended. Um, our online high school classes are our credit advancement courses. So we offer a whole host of courses that we would during the school year, which is a great place to access those all tuition free, guided study to support our students with IEPs so that they, they can access all of these classes. Again, our multilingual learner program, recovery services, extended school year services. It was great to have everybody. We had an extensive internship, ex career exploration, I'm like in a tongue twister here, and mentorship programs. And then a new program, Empower You, which is 
completely online program that 22 students completed um, that is really a self-directed learning program with coaching online and it's really to set future goals and how to be a better learner so it's really focused on who the student is and and the kinds of things that they want from their future so it was a great program this summer and i was really glad to share it with you Good evening. Dr. Scott shared with you earlier the purpose and content of the um, Summer Leadership Institute for all our administrators and supervisors. And the regional superintendents wanted to be sure we were supporting the school leaders, the principals and assistant principals in launching the school year with their school leadership teams and their staff so that the leaders across our system brought focus to their teams. We asked them to launch their year with student achievement at the center to use analysis of student data to inform instruction and to inform their leadership. We asked them to anchor instruction and leadership in equitable practices and strong tier one instruction. To plan for the monitoring of student progress to inform instructional practices that improve student achievement. So in the past, after the Summer Leadership Institute, principals and assistant principal teams would meet as a school team to plan their instructional leadership team meetings and the staff learning improvement days. This year, we brought them together to provide for professional development and intentional time with their teams to plan with the support of their regional superintendent and around colleagues from other schools so that they could collaborate better. We asked them to see themselves as the author of the story of their school and getting people to act in ways that move that story forward to success for each student as their job. So instead of being seen as a character or the main protagonist of the story, help them see themselves as the author, the writers of that story and move those move the people in their schools forward for success. It was evident that they really engaged in this planning uh, in their instructional leadership team meetings and in the learning improvement days. It was clear that improving student achievement was at the center of their work. There was a strong focus on building the capacity of collaborative teams to analyze data, not just standard, standardized test scores, but unit assessments and formative assessments to improve student learning through a continuous improvement model. You can see that they really did focus on data analysis, progress monitoring, and there was still a great amount of uh, emphasis on strengthening teams. And a lot of that was a lot of fun as well. This visual shows our nested approach to school improvement. And you can see our focus is student learning at the core and the connection to our priority student outcomes. In the middle, we have our different improvement routines and structures, including our annual school improvement plans and instructional reviews. This summer, regionals worked closely with school leaders and we can continue to, to develop 90-day improvement cycles. So the first improvement cycle is happening now and will conclude around December. And the second improvement cycle will launch in January, February and go to about spring break. Shorter improvement cycles increase clarity and focus and help school leaders with their instructional teams to adjust resources along the way. And all of these continuous improvement routines and structures that you see here are of course connected to our priority student learning outcomes, to improve student achievement, to ensure that every student is inspired, achieves, and thrives. So how do we keep the momentum going from these, these investments throughout the, throughout the school year? Uh, one way we do this is to establish an annual cadence of meeting structures, and you can see some here. These, these meeting structures are designed to support the folks that are leading the work in the building, so, so principals, teacher leaders, teachers. This is all about support, strategic support and uh, resource reallocation if necessary to make sure that that all of our efforts are promoting the improvement of student achievement so this takes the place uh, in in the form of um, frequent administrator and supervisor meetings those are monthly elementary middle and high school principals meetings uh, periodic uh, collaboration in regions 
consistent and transparent instructional walks to provide feedback and support the action required um, surfaced in informal and more formal uh, walkthroughs like the instructional review process, as well as what's collaboratively developed in those school improvement plans. So we're constantly sharpening uh, this process and this cadence so that we have a consistency and a predictability in our calendar. Um, again, all designed to support staff and leaders in growing student learning in, in all of our buildings for each and every student. And so now we'd like to invite any questions or comments that you might have. Does anyone have any questions? I have a couple. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I just want to say um, first off that I really like the, the term induction and I liked hearing sense of belonging a lot um, because um, that sense of belonging is part of that social emotional. So even for our adults, that they know that somebody has their back and everything. So thank you for that. Um, and then um, there was an article in the paper about regret and how it said that teachers rarely regret, but the pandemic teachers are more likely to regret going into education. So I just want to again thank all of the teachers and all of you that are in education. I hope you have no regrets because seeing those pictures, seeing fewer masks, knowing we still have risk, but that you know a lot of abatement's been done, that I don't think that I, I, I have the sense that this is a different time than 2019 school year start. And it is definitely new um, and so that you couldn't have done this virtually you couldn't have done this with restrictions so just great job with everything and um, i believe i texted ian at one point at, in june or july and just said is summer school starting already because there are buses all over the place oh yeah so i feel like it just you know with everett and everett ready and everything we have year-round school almost for those kids who need it and which i think is lovely and I could definitely tell at Emerson, I believe the kids who were ever ready because they came off a bus in a line or they knew how to walk into the cafeteria in a line. And um, but then there are still the kids that, you know, parents have told them not to talk to strangers and not to follow strangers. And so some of them did struggle following a stranger, which you appreciate, but they do need to, you know, change that. So I, could, I think I could tell the kids who had been ever ready and who hadn't been, which I that with my my layman's vision. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, uh, I, I appreciate all this this summer work. I hope you all did get some rest time in too. But um, I really do think this is valuable for that. Uh, we used to talk about the summer slide, and um, especially this summer, I think it's it's extremely important. Uh, so I hope that we can continue this next summer and if there were some lessons learned, but um, to map it out for next summer too. I just think it, it was really valuable and appreciated. So thank, thank you. Thank you. That's the plan. I, I have one question. If I, oh, student reps, do you have any questions over there? Um, I just have a comment. Um, I was at the new hire event because I'm a cheerleader, so we were cheering at that. And it was great to see all the new staff there. And we just appreciate all that you guys are doing for us. So thank you. Thanks for helping us, Benta. That was really, people comment on um, coming from various places around the state or the country and that particular part being very unique. So thanks for, thanks for doing that for us. I have one question, and um, it goes hand in hand with um, Rep. Uh, Kali said. I was at the new hires, and one of the things that I found out there was the constant, um, I guess you would say, excitement from the new hires. You know, there you, you could you could feel it in the air that they were excited about getting ready, excited about going forward, and and doing the work that they needed to do. And I noticed in our strategic plan that one of the things that we focus in on is student success, but also our resources res success. Our resources being our teachers, our administrators, our staff, you know, anyone who touches a student. And I'm very excited about the change to the continuous improvement plan that we have here when we have the 90 day plan. 
between instructional review and the school improvement plan. When, when we look at your focus on that 90 day period and what kind of resources are necessary for our teachers as well as for our students, I assume for our teachers, because there may be some uh, things that we identify there for our teachers as well. And especially the new teachers that are new to education and that, you know, they may need additional resources. Will the board be in a position to hear at the 90 day plan what additional resources may be necessary for students as well as administrators or teachers so that we can start modifying maybe or adding to any budgetary outlook that we may have so that we can ensure that our teachers, our administrators, our the resources that we have, as well as our students get those additional resources early on so they can make a true difference and not wait until the end of the year, but early on so that they could make a difference to student <coughs> success as well as their own. I appreciate the question. I, I think the way that we would answer that is this is really about mobilizing existing resources. I don't know that we've found a 90 day plan that has substantive additional extra budgetary requests or needs. This is more President Lassane about sort of doubling down on or a lens on analysis of what we've said to be uh, the primary sort of big rocks, right? A term that we use in, in the instructional in review IRs. process, mm -hmm. right? But that also surface in the school improvement plan. So it is about um, analyzing the extent to which we are, are executing the plan right? and these practices, tier one instructional practices, social emotional learning in every classroom. Um, those things are at this point cost neutral. And it, it, it's about the, the fidelity of implementation and the wraparound supports that, that we have committed to deliver and we're going to deliver. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't have my microphone here. I hope everybody was able to hear me. <laughs> Great. Thank you yeah. so much. Because yeah, I, I do want to make sure that we get them for the resources necessary for our new teachers, our new hires, our existing hires, as well, you know, teachers as well, especially for our students, because I see that there is a 90 day plan there. I, I don't know if I've seen that in the past and specifically called out 90 day plan. And how we is that a an area where we can make a difference as a board to ensure that our staff as well as our students get the any additional resources that we those are more frequent checks. So those are the sort of the, those more short cycle assessments of this is a, a again sort of a lens on or a drilling down of the existing plan that can be uh, more easily um, monitored because they're so so much more focused okay. right and then at the at the end of the of the the plan like many uh, schools do in plan do check act or we're responding to the needs that we that we um, are seeing in the buildings we are doubling down on strategies that that have been successful and worked and then we are changing course we're doing that in a more mm -hmm. agile way in that 90-day window rather than waiting for the semester or waiting toward the spring, right? So that, again, that short cycle continuous improvement process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is the name of the game when it comes to uh, comes to 90 day plans. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Sure. Great. We shall now move to our next section. It's in the same section, but it's the school stakeholder annual survey results. And I think presenter Dr. Bolton, she yes. is at the podium. Well, good evening, Board of Directors, President Lassane, Dr. Salzman. Uh, I'm very excited to share with you this evening a review of the School Stakeholder Annual Survey. And as that name suggests, we administer this survey annually 
to, in the spring, to solicit feedback from our key stakeholders. Um, I have a partner here this evening who will introduce in just a few short moments, Lauren Lotto from uh, Panorama Education. Um, but to start, I just want to frame around our survey a little bit. And as I said, this is an annual survey that we administer in the spring to our key stakeholders, which are our students, our staff, and our classified and certificated staff members. While this survey has several reports, and you have a copy, I believe, at the dais tonight, um, there are over 100 pages of data for you to review. We will not be going over all 105 pages this evening. However, um, we've pulled out three data stories of both celebration and opportunities to share with you this evening. And as we know in our system, we review data not to admire that data, but to dig deep and analyze how we can inform um, our next steps of our interactions. So school leaders have actually been working with their leadership teams to unpack some of their building specific data and develop plans to meet the needs of those schools. Alongside those leadership teams, the family, this family, staff, and student data has been used to identify goals and to develop action plans for the 22-23 school year. So you may know that this annual survey is one of the requirements of the minimum basic ed compliance from the State Board of Education, where we solicit feedback from constituents to guide school improvement planning. This is a part of our school improvement process. This year, however, it was also a key component in our district recovery plan, which was a requirement from OSPI in the state. And this actually provided information and feedback to us to help us narrow our focus and meet the needs of our students, staff, and families as we began our recovery from pandemic impact. So when we think about our strategic themes that you can see up here on the screen, we know that engaging community stakeholders for input is one of those themes but really the listening of stakeholder feedback goes beyond just that specific theme. We listen to those voices of our constituents and it helps us to develop many of our other themes as well, specifically consistency and accountability, supportive culture and equitable access. So it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Lauren Lau, who is our account director and partner at Panorama Ed. And Lauren joins us virtually via Zoom and I'm going to let her introduce herself. So Lauren, would you like to take the slide? Great, thanks so much, Dr. Bowden, and thanks everyone for having me tonight. I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Lauren Lado, and I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, I work as an account director for Panorama Education, primarily supporting our wonderful Oregon and Washington school district partners, of course, including Everett Public Schools. Before we jump in to Everett's specific data from last spring, I'd love to share just a little bit about who Panorama is as a company and the partnership that we have with Everett. So our mission is to radically improve education for every student through data. We're very proud to partner with 12 state agencies and 1500 school districts, supporting over 15 million students nationwide. Our work brings together social emotional learning, multi-tiered systems of support, positive behavior intervention support, and stakeholder voice, which is what we're gonna be talking about this evening. Ultimately, our work uh, serves to empower educators with the data and tools they need to support the whole child. Uh, you can go ahead and flip. So Panorama's work empowering educators falls into four interconnected buckets, which you can see on the screen now all of which Everett is going to be using this upcoming school year. So the first bucket is our stakeholder feedback surveys, which is what we'll primarily be discussing tonight. On behalf of school districts, Panorama collects stakeholder feedback from students, staff, and family to elevate all stakeholder voices across school systems. This feedback helps us not only learn about all the stakeholders in our system, but guides our work and helping us to adapt, respond, and make changes ultimately helping Everett better meet the needs of our students, staff, and families. The second bucket is our social emotional learning assessments and check-ins for students and staff. The third is our MTSS platform, which we use across the district called Student Success. This platform combines social emotional learning data, academic data, behavior data, and attendance data in one platform. So teachers are able to review and create intervention plans for students. And our fourth bucket is our brand new positive behavior platform, um, which we're gonna be rolling out in the district this year. 
Um, like, like Dr. Bilton said, today we're just going to be sharing three really exciting data highlights from the data. And I know that you all have a big packet or binder with all of the rest of the data, and we're excited for you to review that as well. Uh, you can go ahead. Great. So the first story that we'd like to highlight is our student data about relationships and connection within our schools. To provide context, of course, for this data, the 2021 set of data reflected students who had either been in hybrid or fully remote school contexts. 2022 data, of course, shows in contrast, students' experiences having returned to in-person school. In both data sets, 612 and 35, student surveys showed significant increases in students' sense of connection. In particular, the two data sets below, we saw exciting double-digit increases and how connected students feel to their peers at their school. I think it's especially exciting to look at the 21% increase. I'll hand it back to you, uh, Dr. Bolton, to give a little bit more context about this highlight. Thank you. <coughs> so to provide again with some context, in the spring of 21, so we had some students who were still in hybrid and we had some students who were fully remote. Um, and then in spring of 22, we were fully in person instruction with the exception of Ever Virtual Academy. So in the spring of 22, the contrast, um, because of that contrast, one of the things that we noticed is that we believe that we led to this increase in favorable responses with the intentional focus on social emotional learning. Prior to the start of the school year, we had re-engagement programs like Everett Ready for kindergarten, but we also last year had Jumpstart for first and second graders, gearing them up to re-enter um, re school and develop their school readiness as well. Um, we spent the first five days of our school year last year really intentionally focusing on reconnection, community building, um, and five days of social emotional learning, real intentional focus around that. And so while we're pleased with these results, we're not satisfied. We still have gains and we have room to grow. So we are continuing our relationship building, our cultivation of school climate, as well as positive behavior supports in schools, um, our restorative practices and student-centered activities. And as you heard earlier this evening, your experiences in our first days of schools, we're glad that you could feel that excitement, you could feel that reconnection, and you could feel that focus that we're continuing on with that great work. Thank you. So the second data highlight is from our family stakeholder survey. We're really pleased to see that there were few, few, fewer, far fewer, excuse me, concerns reported by our families around SEL, academics, and behavior as indicated by significant growth from 2021. Increases ranging from 13 to 25 percent in the favorable responses. And I'll just point out here that we do similar surveys across school districts all over the nation and sometimes just see four or 5% growth. So these are really outside of the norm and really exceptional levels of growth in this area. So again, to provide some context around this, in the spring of 21 um, and in the, the, that 2021 school year, families had very limited access to events, volunteers were very limited, and homeschool communication was almost entirely virtual. Um, so some key actions that we actually think led to such positive and favorable results was the intentional development of innovative communication systems. You may remember that we did monthly Let's Connect virtual meetings with our community to solicit feedback, to take questions, to share information. We had opportunities for both virtual and in-person conferences for parents, um, really trying to capitalize on uh, innovative ways to connect with our families. And we also had some increases in those student support services. So for example, we had um, some of our elementary secondary schools emergency relief funds or ESSER funds were actually funded for some tutoring and extended day school support, um, after school support like the Springboard Collaborative, which focused on early literacy at some of our title schools. And it allowed us to continue to partner with our families in support of the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral growth. In, and in addition, we intentionally placed programs like Everett Ready and Jumpstart to help reacclimate students to school as well. 
So um, continuation, our next steps really focus on the continuation of that academic, social, emotional, and behavioral learning. Again, we are pleased, but we are not satisfied. We have room to grow. And so we're going to continue with those efforts around social, emotional, behavioral learning. And our huge focus is really helping to increase student academic achievement this year. Um, continuous progress monitoring of our learning going on in schools and talking about some of those 90 day plans and really focused on that work. In addition, our October 14th Lib Day, the professional development, will be engaging in a district-wide professional learning focused on the work of Mark Brackett, who is the author of Permission to Feel, um, and Ruler Training. And details of this professional learning event will be coming, um, they'll be finalized, I think, this week or early next week, and will be shared with the board as well. Great. So our final story is from our teacher survey, and this one is a growth area. <clears throat> Similar to districts nationwide, one of the challenges that Everett experienced was in the area of providing staff with meaningful professional development. This was in the wake of significant substitute teacher shortages and increases and in absences due to illness. Given these challenges, it's not a surprise to see that this is an area of growth for the district, and it's certainly one that we're seeing across the nation as well. Uh, like Dr. Bolton is about to talk about, the team is already, already has plans well underway to think through how to provide teachers with meaningful professional development this school year. Exactly. So in the spring of 20 and 21, we did extensive professional learning focused on remote and hybrid tools and practices. But in the 21 and 22 school year, it was fully in person and it was impacted by substitute shortages um, that impacted professional learning access for our staff. Um, so we did some deferment of professional learning to uh, after the student day, we beefed up our summer professional learning opportunities and we increased something that we call the capacity builders model, meaning we do training centralized and we actually have our coaches and other staff go back into buildings, working with their professional learning communities and their teams to help continue some of that professional development. However, we do know that that was significantly impacted by substitute shortage, teacher capacity to just be able to do the extra hours. And additionally, a lot of the people who were running professional development were actually focused on covering classes and substituting because that continuity of instruction for our young students needed to continue. And that was the priority. So as we look forward to our next steps, we're doing a lot of really great things, including early hiring of substitutes this fall. Um, providing professional learning opportunities in August. Mimi Brown sampled a few of those earlier in a presentation and really focusing on learning options that do not rely on substitutes. So we do things like observation of evidence of learning, which requires typically some substitutes to go and do peer observations. We've found some innovative ways of covering those with internal staff. So administrators covering classes, coaches and covering classes, teachers covering on their planning time, that provide those opportunities for professional learning and observation of, um, of other of their peers in the actual work setting. So there are some different opportunities that we're looking at, but we are continuing to support professional learning and growth for our staff across the board. Thank you. So we're really honored to continue this work with Everett, particularly gathering really important feedback <laughs> from stakeholders across the system. So two important things coming up this year. We have our fall student SEL survey just starting next week and running through the start of October. So this data feeds into the student success platform for MTSS programs to look at alongside those other three data sources that I mentioned. And then we'll be running our annual school stakeholder survey in March of 2023 to continue gathering feedback from students, staff, and families. So we want to thank you for your attention uh, to these highlights. And again, we are pleased with some of our feedback, but we're not yet satisfied. We still have room to grow. We still are pushing ourselves to utilize this data in really meaningful ways to help improve the student experience and student achievement across the board. Um, and we're excited to be able to share this with you. And I think we'll be even more excited in March of 23 in looking at our improved results then. So thank you. And we'll take any comments and questions at this time. Yes, comments and questions at this time. Yes, correct. correct so, I mean, I, I, as you all are, um, I'm pretty concerned about the, um, you know, looking like across the board that our certificated staff, all their results 
across the board seem to be down. Um, and I understand this is a national trend, uh, but particularly when it comes to professional needs and, and professional development opportunities, did we explore it all with them, how many they were actually able to you know, avail themselves of over the past year and of those, like, so my, I guess my question is really around, is it the content or is it the opportunity? Um, and to me, that, that that's something that's not clear through the data here. Sure. I, I think that's a great clarifying question. Um, I think that we have some data and some feedback from staff that says um, that it wasn't that they weren't, they weren't able to access some of that professional learning. I think some of the professional learning um, around uh, student, like being able to help address student behaviors, some of the regulation, um, we do know that that was an area that was a concern for staff last year. I think that a lot of the work around ruler and some of the self-regulation strategies that we're teaching students now has helped to alleviate that. But we do solicit continued feedback um, from all of our professional development. So all of the professional development that we held over the summer and in August, we solicit that feedback of, how was this and what do you still need so that we're able to refine our lens a little bit on are we actually meeting your needs, not just with access, but also with the quality and quantity of, of professional learning uh, provided. Okay. And then follow on to that. Um, when you started offering kind of after hours professional development, did you see a significant um, percentage of teachers availing themselves of those options? Or was it really more of kind of like your dedicated few that that got to it? I think it really depended on the timing and context of that training. So there were some um, there were some teachers that really said, yep, we need the training. We're going to go ahead and we're going to participate in some of those pieces. So for example, some of the um, math adoption curricula and training, um, we had people who were, were committed in attending those pieces. Um, it really also depended on the capacity of those teachers. Some of them were covering classes during the day, so they were missing their prep time. And because they were missing their prep time, they needed to dedicate their after school hours to that prep time. So it wasn't teacher disinterest. I think it was just teacher capacity. Sure. Um, and so we that's why we try and offer a variety um, of different professional learning opportunities, whether that's in person, we will still offer some things in, in virtual training because it's just easier to access after school. Um, but we, when we solicit information around what kinds of professional needs you have, those are some of the questions that we ask, like what's, what's a better fit? Um, certainly when we compensate people after hours, that, that changes some of our budgeting pieces, but we're trying to find a happy medium where we can optimize how much training people can get and also make sure that they're getting it in a timely way. Yeah, that's the, and really that comes down to my main concern is are we piling this as additional duties that they're expected to complete and not be compensated for? Um, you know, that's that's my only real concern with this. Yeah, and I, I, we are also concerned with that because we believe that our teachers should be compensated for some of those training opportunities. Um, and so while we can pay them after school, sometimes it's just not, it doesn't work for their schedules because they aren't able to access that. Some people have childcare. I mean, there's a lot of different factors oh, yeah. that go into that, oh, yeah. which is why we're trying to optimize where we can do substitute release and being really intentional around that. Um, making sure that we have good substitutes, we have subs in place, we have sub plans in place so that we can have continuity of instruction for our students and still provide that professional learning opportunity during their regular work day as we can. I have some uh, follow-up questions on this that um, I think would probably be better if I just emailed because it gets a little, a little yeah. bit into the weeds. Um, and uh, that way, and then you can respond either directly or to the board or however you want to do that. Certainly. But I'll yield to this one. Thank you very much, Director Nichols. Uh, Director Mason, you have a question. I, I do. I um, Actually, Director Nichols addressed um, one of my main questions. Yeah. Um, he addressed mine, too. In a, yeah, in a great, you know, and what it is is really is what is our mechanism for understanding, to me, more the quality of the PD that we're offering, because what I'm seeing trending through the data a little bit is, you know, school climate is is way down for staff and um, both certificated and classified um, pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. And and 
one thing that really jumped out at me is the sense of belonging in elementary, early elementary, yes. 80 to 99th percentile. I mean, that's huge. And then six through 12, zero to 10th percentile. Like, yes. where is the disconnect there that these kids come in, they're happy, they feel a part of their school. And, and I know that that's very common as kids get older and um, social, social situations change. Um, for them to not feel that warm fuzzy of those early grades. But um, I'm also looking at the teachers aren't feeling that as well if those two are slightly connected, which I think they are. Um, you know, we have really poured a lot of energy and effort and dollars into our social emotional learning um, and supports for both teachers and students. And I'm just kind of wondering how we are measuring that payoff and are, are those efforts sort of hitting um, what we're, what our intentions are. I'm not sure if that's a question. Yes. <laughs> it was a, it was a good it was concern. I'm, I'm, I, it is a concern I'm, I'm bringing up for maybe some more information. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, I think your concern is duly noted. And, and I think it is a concern that our leadership team and our staff also have, which is what is it that is happening here and how can we drill down deep into some of that data? So of course tonight was a highlight of some of the, just a really 30,000 foot view of some of that data. But what our teams are doing is really digging deep into that data at their building site level and looking at some of that student data, looking at some of that staff data. And so while there's some generalities saying, hey, what's happening here with secondary? Really, you know, middle school, middle school teams can look at that and say, what does this look like in this building? What does this look like with this group of students? And more importantly, what can we do about that to actually address those so that we can improve our experiences for our students? Thank you. Director Herman, do you have any questions? I'll just actually you hit the, you hit the one <laughs> one of the big things that had jumped out for me, but also what you were saying about the school level, um, the three to five and six to 12. But I got to imagine that at each school level there, you can just take that data apart and really dig into it and it probably looks very different too, once you're looking at your feeder schools and so I guess one of the questions I did want to ask tonight is, um, so we do have all these data for individuals. Um, and so students moving through, for example, I'm just trying to wrap my head around, um, for example, for, for their questionnaires and their scores, that gets entered into the MTSS um, dashboard and, and for that student follows them along as they go. Um, so it's just really rich data. I, there's there's so many layers here, both looking at an individual school and then district that I, I can imagine you're, you can go <laughs> so deep in. Um, so I appreciate that we have this though, uh, but that's a very big 30,000 foot view. Really, really powerful data tools at our fingertips. And, um, and you're right, you can look at individual student data and the student success platform that can help, um, for example, counselors say, hey, who might be really struggling with some of their connectedness or sense of belonging? How do we intentionally reach out to them? And how do we make sure that we are helping to support them in their student experience here? Um, and then general themes that a building might see or even class or grade level might see mm -hmm. that you can have teams really dig Digging deep into and using that data, not to admire it, but to actually take actions that are going to help make it better for our students. I just asked one follow up question then mm -hmm. because we have the individual data, are, would we look then at different subgroups of students district wide and be able to look? How, how do certain groups of students feel and separate the disaggregated a little bit more? Absolutely, and we utilize some of that disaggregated data to look at student groups, not as a deficit, but to where do we see opportunities for growth? Where do we see celebrations? What's, what's going right with those students and finding ways to replicate that? Director Mitchell, did you have any questions? I have several questions, but I wanna see if the students have any questions. Okay because I have several, if that's okay. Uh, first one, I think doc, um, Director Andrews sort of asked it, like if he has questions, email, but um, this is a lot to digest. And I remember getting this last year and I think I must've missed the meeting or if there was a meeting, I didn't appreciate it as much. Now that just looking at it, um, I, I wonder like who is the right person or people to reach out to if we have questions or is it maybe an opportunity for, um, just sort of a zoom call to just sort of i've got my list and email you and you bring in the right people or 
what what is the right avenue for us if as we look at this if we have specific questions and let me just direct it yes uh it could be directed to any uh, peter shelley or any regional okay because we look over this data uh, everybody's breaking down the data with their school centers so any person that you want to contact okay thank you okay. and then um next question and this could be for lauren um because i sort of paused on the the parent data um, looks like about a 27% or 2,700 parents. Um, it's about what 10% of our kiddos, but I'm not quite sure how many families we have. Um, but is that rate reasonable or is it low high? What, what would you say compared to the aggregate of students? Yeah, that's a great question. And unfortunately, we typically see the lowest uh, response rate in our family survey when we do kind of the trifecta of family, teacher, and student. Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that that, you know, we can we can talk about. But um, I would say that's pretty middle of the road. It's certainly not like alarmingly low, um, but it's definitely something that we want to support our district partners um, in increasing because we know that family stakeholder uh, feedback is so vital to kind of the overall picture of the district. Okay, thank you for that. Because in with 2700, um, does that is that a big enough number to show that this the data we see is valid? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And because that's what um, as I look on sort of the last page of parents, it looks like it's pretty, um, pretty average um, K through eight, and then it really falls off. And so it's it, it is, I think it's great that at least K through eight, it's pretty standard. Yeah. Um, but then I wonder too, just just a very high level question. Um, yes, that that parent engagement is is high, but for and and I and I I do believe because of some research studies survey research we're not going to please all the people all the time, but when I see a number like ten percent almost ten percent of families, um, almost twenty percent are actually quite concerned or extremely concerned about um, their child's growth or their child child's well being. Do we have a threshold for those? Um, those numbers that it's like if it's one of them is two percent maybe two percent. That's not a high priority, but for getting almost 20% concern, like, yes, we should celebrate the, the, the you know, the almost 73% positive, but how do, like, it's an anonymous survey, but I, how do we do that? I think, um, I think even 1% is a concern. I yeah. think that when we're not reaching all families, then that's problematic for us. Mm -hmm. And I will say one of the things that principals and their leadership teams have done with this data is they've actually dug deep into it and take a look, taken a look at like, hey, our participation with families was low. What are some very intentional strategies we are going to make this year to increase that number when our survey comes out? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we can look and we can disaggregate some data. We can take a look at what's, what families' voices are not coming to the table. And what are some very intentional strategies we can do to invite and not just welcome and invite, but reach out to those mm -hmm. families. So we can do things from anything from, um, you know, your Let's Connect meetings that we're gonna continue to do like listening tours in person this year to things like natural leaders where we are in, engaging our families in authentic ways and bringing them in um, in a way that makes them feel like their voice is valued mm -hmm. and important. So it is one of those things that um, I would say, like I said, 1% is concerning yeah, and we should know. always be looking at what can we do to capitalize on capturing those voices in a more meaningful and intentional way. Exactly. Thank, you. Thank you. I would like to add is this data is very useful and you can use it in so many different ways. I asked the question earlier about getting resources to the right people at the right time so that we're not delayed out maybe six months or a year out. But I like the 90 day plan that you look at what's necessary at that time. And when I look at some of the data that I see here in this survey, one of the concerns I have was kids now know I need, I have a problem with math that came out in the three to five, uh, third grade, the fifth grade survey results where they said, yes, math is a concern, I need help. We know this at this particular time, what additional resource can we do for our third to fifth graders so that they can do better at math early on than st instead of later? The teachers, what can we do to provide them the additional PD? Because 
it came out. Director Nichols brought it up and I'm glad he did because that was my question too. When I asked the question earlier, what can we do earlier than later to assist people, our resources like teachers, as well as our students who need help. The engagement uh, aspect of the survey, how engaged are our kids at this particular point in time? The six to 12th graders not being as engaged as we would expect them to be. And that could be because it's a survey. It's very difficult to get high schoolers, you know, six middle schoolers and high schoolers to answer questions on a survey. What can we do to find out from them certain responses that we can that can benefit them? Well, and when we look at data, when we look at our survey data, it's one slice of that picture. And yeah. so being able to get this into the hands of our principals, get this into the hands of those teachers, staff, and really have them digging deep and thinking about those ideas. We have one of the greatest resources we have is our human capital. It's our brilliant principals, our amazing teachers, and the regionals who are helping to guide them in their schools. And so it's that just-in-time responsiveness and the short cycle assessment, here's one piece of data. What else do we need to learn? What else do we need to know to help refine a better action plan to meet the needs of those students? So a student who says, I struggle in math might need um, more time or opportunities to grow, might need more connection and attention from that staff member. And the, the best people to be able to do that are the expert practitioners in those buildings. And that's exactly what they're doing when they're developing their action plans. Any further questions? And well, with that, we're gonna take a five minute break at this particular time. Uh, this is over. Once we come back after five minutes, we'll be going into unfinished business. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have like 10 minutes left in our meeting.
and then I just pushed away so I don't accidentally say something. <laughs> I just have to say that. I really like that. Okay, he's ready. Okay. We will now reconvene. We'll be moving to section 13.0, which is unfinished business, but we have no unfinished business scheduled for this meeting. And so we now move to section 14.0, which is our new business section. And it's all policies. And so I note that Mr. Fleckenstein is at the podium and he will cover the entire list of new policies. Yes, and I do appreciate the board's patience in advance for the 11 <laughs> policies that are on our agenda tonight. Um, to be as succinct and uh, efficient as possible, you'll notice I'll abbreviate a repetitive con uh, uh, content tonight. So just to begin, the first of our four, four group of four policies uh, proposed revisions to policy 1400 meetings are to comply with House Bill 1329 concerning public meeting accessibility and participation, where the new law requires governing bodies to provide an opportunity for public comment before action is taken. The public comment period may be taken orally at the public meeting or by providing an opportunity for written testimony to be submitted before or at the meeting. If the written testimony is accepted, it must be distributed to the board before the meeting. Uh, proposed revisions to also align with requirements outlined in House Bill 1630 concerning the restriction of uh, possessing a weapon in certain locations. Following these changes in the law, the open carry uh, of guns and other weapons at city and city council meetings, election sites, and off-campus school board meetings are now prohibited. Uh, revisions to policy 1400 meetings and these two House bills I will briefly reference in the next three. Uh, have been previously reviewed by legal counsel and superintendent's executive cabinet. Are there any comments? A question, I, I a question is, is the one that's up here, the 1400, is that for public comment or is this the meetings, like the board of directors attending meetings? Um, this is the conduction of the actual different types of meetings okay. the board would convene. Then my question is because of um, COVID and stuff, um, we did go to like that virtual option and um, there have been times where a board member might need to to attend virtually. Um, does this pro, pro, do we need a policy that allows that? Because I don't see in here that it prohibits it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we want it standard that a board member will attend virtually if they can't attend in person. Although I can't recall the number straight off my head this yeah. evening. We have already included at the time in the last two years a provision that allows for board members to participate in a meeting by their phone, um, phoning yeah. into the meeting or zooming into the meeting, and that is still in place within your policies. Okay, so this doesn't overlay. Okay, thank you. It does not take that away. No. Thank you. I, thank you. Any further comments? Can we move this by general consent? We'll move this on to second reading. Very well. Let's move on. There are lots of them. Yeah, revisions of policy 40, uh, 1410 executive or closed sessions are to comply with House Bill 1329. As I previously stated, the impact of these changes concerning public meeting accessibility and participation requirements now requires governing bodies to provide an opportunity for public comment before action is taken and are presented this evening for your consideration. I had one question on this particular one because it talks about the difference between closed sessions and executive session. How does this change what we have been doing previously in announcing them during our public, you know, our meetings? How is there any change for us and how we've been announcing them to the public? No. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? By general consent, we'll move this on to the second reading. Thank you very much. Policy 1440, meeting conduct, order of business, and quorum also comply with House Bill 1329. The impact of these changes concerning public meeting accessibility and participation requires governing bodies to provide an opportunity for public comment before action is taken.
Are there any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Director Herman. I was just noticing that um, several of these policies, they insert the word knowingly, uh, knowingly carry on to regarding firearms. And, I, I, and I, it looks like that is a reflection of meeting the RCW, um, that that is just the standard wording that we need to adopt. Yes. Correct. Thank you. A general consent, we'll move this on to second reading. Or are there any further questions? Very well, we should move this on to second reading. And the fourth in this cluster of policy revisions is policy 1441, audience participation, which also complies with House Bill 1329, allowing for audience participation in the public comment section on the board agenda before a board action is taken. Um, I had one question about this one, and that had to do with, like today, we had a comment that was sent to us from a, a person who wanted to just have us read it. We don't have to read it in the meeting. We can read it at a later date. This does not require us to orally read, to verbally read their questions or their comments, correct? Um, as is on the screen here um, in the middle of the paragraph, it it shows that public comment may occur orally or through written comments submitted before the meeting. But it doesn't say that we have to read their written it comments. It does not oblige you to read them during Thank the meeting. Thank you. Okay. That's my question. I appreciate that clarity. Yeah, because if we could read it later, but we don't have to read their comments. Well, and I, and I do have a concern about about one either a staff person or us, it, it, it's their written statement. If, if they want to speak to us verbally, it's their voice versus a written statement that we can, that isn't, you know, then there's no voice attached. Any further comments? Then by general consent, we'll move this to second read, reading. Student reps, please, please, if, if you have a comment, Please say so, okay. I'll go to the next policy. Yes, our next policy is policy 3116. Students in out of home or foster care are provided to comply with House Bill 1955. This bill pertains to students subject to dependency proceedings and changes the requirements connected to the transmission of educational records, reviews of unexpected or excessive absences, educational continuity, continuity along with the associated student transport, transportation, and on-time grade level progression and graduation. The revisions include changing the title from students in out of home or foster care to students in foster care. Can I, can I ask a question just because of ignorance on my part? Um, when you have kids that are li living in group homes, are, is that a form of foster care? The, um, I think what this is intended to do is to students who are not living at with home. at home with a biological parent or right. in the custody uh, uh, right. guardian, right? Yeah, because out this of home could them. also imply a group home, but foster care is specific. So that's my concern is foster care the same as if a child or is group home considered foster care? You know, what I can do is I, I can get the definition and the difference of that for you and provide that um, at a later okay. future date. And I, I guess along with that, that clarity of the title was out of home foster care. And so I wonder if it's a semantic change. Yeah. to just make it foster care instead of that at a home to be very specific to foster parents in this policy versus other types of living situations, which would be a group home yeah. or something. So I think just a little clarity that could sure. just help with that, just so that we know we're, how, right. what, how we're serving our students. Yes, because I do know there are some group homes, but I don't know if that's considered the same as foster care. Mm -hmm. I know it's considered out of home, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, are, didn't, did we not have to abide by 
caring for those students educationally? I don't know. Yes, I think to just be succinct, the, the change to the titling is specific and it's specific mm -hmm. to say in this particular circumstance, foster students in foster care. So uh, happy to get a more accurate de definition for you just to clarify before second read. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Any comment? We shall then get clarification. And also, we can still move this to second reading with clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, proposed revisions to policy 3430 comprehensive safe school plans comply with House Bill 1941, which prohibits active shooter scenarios for school safety related drills and mandates that students, teachers and staff should continue to be provided with the content taught in active shooter trainings. However, this content is now required to be implemented in a trauma informed and age uh, or developmentally appropriate manner. House Bill 1941 intends to create an environment for all students, teachers and staff to learn potentially life saving knowledge without causing undue stress or psychological harm. Policy 3430 has been reviewed previously by legal counsel and the superintendent's executive cabinet. Are there any questions or comments? I guess I'm just asking a question um, that came up. I think we looked at something like this, or maybe even this last year, or when, when Director Berg was on the board that, the, that this area up here is really the, the reunification and a concern for South End parents getting up here have we um did we look into that at all how to help that or having if something happens in the south end that it stays in the south end or something to address because i think that is an outstanding question because of our length of our district and a hardship on families from woodside having to get all the way up here i think your your question is specific to our reunification plans yes. and um, is that the, a separate policy that we looked at before versus this one yeah, this particular, the revisions that are put here are designed to um, be specific, and Thank it has to do with active shooter trainings. What it intends to avoid is by not announcing or having any sort of uh, advanced notice to schools that there's going to be an active shooter event that is a training exercise. So students, staff, and people on campus think it's real, and that creates undue uh -huh. psychological uh, or stress or harm. Yeah people. So the intent of these revisions, there are several other um, updates to the policy itself, but the House bill's intent with the revisions is to keep that sort of undue psychological stress, um, you know, from people on campus when it's really intended to be a drill. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? We shall now move this to second reading. All right, uh, we have a series here. Uh, this is also related to a previous reading on House Bill 1630 for our first four policy revisions tonight. Proposed revisions to policy 4207, regulation of firearms and dangerous weapons on school district property, comply with House Bill 1630, where the open carry of guns and other weapons and at city and, pardon me, at city and county council meetings Election sites and off campus school board meetings are now prohibited. These revisions have previously been reviewed by legal counsel in the superintendent's executive cabinet. Are there any questions or comments? This is a good one. We shall move this to second reading. Yeah. Uh, policy 5131, hiring of retired school employees, comply with House Bill 1699, which now permits school districts to hire retired school district employees for up to 1,040 hours per school year without disruption to their retired employees' pension benefits through July 1st of 2025, allowing districts now to hire experienced and qualified employees to address open positions critical to the operation of schools and the district. These revisions have been reviewed by legal counsel and the superintendent's executive cabinet. Are there any comments or questions? We shall move this to second reading. Um, similar to the bill that I just read, sorry, I lost my notes here. Um, this, <laughs> there's a lot of them tonight. 
5410 is for substitute employment, similar to the revisions on the previous policy. It grants changes that would allow us to hire retired employees back for a maximum of <coughs> 1,000 um, in, sorry, 40, thank you, um, hours without impacting their pension benefits. This is for our substitutes. This is for substitutes. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Director Herman has a question. Yeah, uh, just on this one, um, the part about spouse of an officer, uh, I had to just look that up. It looks like for the House bill, that's referring to firefighter or law enforcement officer, correct? Um, yeah. Sorry. For the fifth, uh, am I on the right one, 5410? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That just caught my eye a little bit. I thought, officer, what is, what is that? And then, um, so looking back at the House bill, does that need clarification or can we so state officer type i'm sorry i don't understand your question can we put into the text what type of officer we're talking about are we talking about an officer of the district talking about an officer of the court are we talking about a peace officer what officer is this sure uh, i can do a revision and submit it for just it just caught my eye because i it looked a little until i looked back at the bell so they can line up Okay. You, you got. You have all done a lot of work to get these bills or <laughs> to get the policy. So thank you. Yep. I will. I will look into that revision. So with that yeah. revision or that concern address, can we now move this to second reading? Thank you. All right. Revisions to policy six one one two rental lease or use of surplus real district uh, district real property comply with House Bill sixteen thirty prohibiting guns and other weapons at off district property school board meetings. However, on duty law enforcement, security, and military are still allowed to carry weapons in such locations. Proposed revisions to policy six one one two rental lease or use of surplus district real property have been reviewed by legal counsel and the superintendent's executive cabinet. Excuse me, you said military can carry weapons when in that capacity or in general? Um, on duty. On duty. So recall that the law here is not exclusive only to school board meetings that are um, at sites other than its normal meeting location. This also applies to city councils. It also applies to other governing bodies within our state. Are we able to um, include verbiage that, well, I guess it doesn't really, this doesn't really address who on, it's just a pro prohibition against people. Mm -hmm. Is that I, I saw that and I, I was like, well, you know, I'm a veteran. Does that mean I get to get carry a firearm on in you know government buildings? Is it all retired military? Is it active duty military? Do they have to be under the command during a national emergency? Like, what's the like? That's a huge nebulous um, class of people that can carry firearms on a government facility. Yeah, I think that, as I it stated within the, the revision and in its intent, on-duty law enforcement, on-duty security, which we do not have officer uh, on-duty security who carries weapons, and then on-duty military. So if there was a governing body on property related to on-duty military, they would be allowed to then have that. Any further questions or comments? We can move this to second reading. And finally, tonight, uh, revisions to policy 6700 food and nutrition program are provided this evening to comply with House Bill 1878, requiring public school districts to group their schools to the extent practical in a manner that maximizes the community eligibility provision in the national school lunch program. The community eligibility provision offers an alternative to the traditional method of individual families applying for free or reduced price meals via the household application. Instead, a school district can use the community eligibility provision to provide free meals to all students in schools where at least 40% of students are identified as eligible for free meals through means other than the household application. 
Examples of alternatives for identifying eligibility would include students directly certified through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or temporary assistance for needy families and foster homeless and migrant students. Proposed revisions of Policy 6700 Food and Nutrition Program have been reviewed by legal counsel and the Superintendent's Executive Cabinet prior to tonight's meeting. Any questions or comments? That being said, by general consent, we'll move this on to second reading. Thank you very much, Mr. Fleckenstein. We shall now move to next section, which is section 15.0, which is upcoming agenda items. Dr. Salsman, what's planned for our upcoming agenda items and meetings? Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public. At the October 4th special meeting, the board will hear a start of school update. At our October 25th meeting, the board will contain the following, the annual achievement presentation, several policies for second reading, an enrollment update, <coughs> impressed in counts, cancel warrants, surplus technology, graduation services accessories contract, highly capable program grant, OSPI Equity Dual Credit Grant, Gertrude J Jackson Roster, and the Perkins Grant CT Program Evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzman. We'll now move to Session 16.0, which is Executive Closed Sessions. The Open Public Meetings Act provides that the board discussions on certain, certain topics may be held in an executive session. Tonight, the board will hold an executive session to discuss with legal counsel representing the agency litigation or potential litigation, which the agency is or is likely to become a party to. The anticipated length of the executive session is 40 minutes. No action may be taken during the executive session. With that being said. Yep. Thank you. After 40 minutes, we'll return to the regular meeting to extend if necessary or adjourn. Thank you very much.
I would like to now adjourn the meeting uh, September 13th of the Everett Public School Board of Directors to a close. We are now adjourned. Thank you.